verses, which will be King James Version, and then Deacon Lorenzo Peary will need, read the second. Luke 6, chapter, verses 1 through 12. And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the cornfields, and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do you that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? And Jesus answering them said, Have ye not read so much as this? What David did when himself was an hundred, and they which were with him. How he went into the house of God, and did take and eat, the shoe bread, and gave also to them that were with him, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone. And he said unto them, That the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Amen. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. There was a man whose right hand was withered, and the scribes and the Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an acquisition against him. But he knew their thoughts, and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored, hold as the other. And they were filled with madness and consumed with one another commune with one another what might what they might do to Jesus. Verse 12, and it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. May God add a blessing to the readers and especially the doers of his holy word. Amen, 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 amen. Now the next day when they had come out of Bethany he was hungry and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves he went to see if per perhaps he would find something on it when he came to it he found nothing but leaves for it was not the season for figs in response Jesus said to it let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple 
and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who had sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he talked, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and saw, excuse me, and saw how they might destroy him. For they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teachings. When evening had come, he went out of the city. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree die up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you, you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and doubts, and does no doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive it, and you will have them. Amen. 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 Continue to keep your minds, hearts focused on the word. We are here to worship, serve, and celebrate as we continue on this journey called life. So that when it is our time, we know where we will be with our Heavenly Father. But we have a job to do while we're here. And it might seem like a valley. It might seem like a valley. But we're going to go to the mountaintop if we My do Lord. what thus says the Lord. Amen. We will have another song in worship by our wonderful choir. And then the next words that you will hear will come from our pastor, Pastor Stacy, as he brings forth the message. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and again, especially the doers of his holy word. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
giving honor to God who is the head of my life. Amen. Giving honor to this wonderful host of musicians we have. We truly thank you for accompanying us today. Thank yes. you so much. Yes. I'm just excited for you because I know that definitely in this day and in this week, I've got many calls about illness, unfortunately. But one thing we know, God is still in control. Yes. 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 So we continue to keep those who are ill and shut in at this time in our prayers. And we will definitely make sure we pray for each and every one of them before we leave today. Amen. Yes. So good morning, Greater Four O'Clock. Good morning. Good morning, good morning Greater Four O'Clock. Good morning. Now it's funny, in the English vernacular, this, these words are said as a greeting. Basically, you say them as a greeting with no true meaning behind it. You simply are acknowledging that it is morning time and that someone has come into your presence, at least in the hours of the a.m. When you're at work, when you're at school, or when you're at the grocery store, you just easily belt out, good morning. Now, but when I stand before you today, church, I don't want to make it just a blanket statement. When I stand before you today, I want to make sure that this good morning is heartfelt and soul stirring. Because today I want to make sure that I mean what I'm saying, say what I mean. So instead of simply saying good morning, let me explain why today is a good morning. See, it's a good morning because I woke up and I was alive. last night and some woke up to glory while others woke up to damnation. Mm. See, it's a good morning, church, because I have life and strength in my body. Yes. I have another opportunity to get right yes. with the master. Yes. See, I woke up on planet Earth and I'm alive and well and can see this wonderful congregation called Greater Four o'clock. Yes. It's a good morning. Yes. So I can reset and restart. Yes. A good morning because we have the opportunity to break and share the bread of life together yes. between each and every one of us. Yes. To tell dying women, men, and boys, and girls that Jesus is real. Yes. And if you don't know him as the Savior of yes. your life, today you can get to know him just a little bit better. Yes. See, it's a good morning. I see faces today that are hungry for the word, yes. that are hungry for an answer, yes. that are hungry for a breakthrough that can only be found in the person of Jesus Christ. Yes. Church, it is a good morning. Yes. I understand today that the devil is a defeated foe. Yes. And just as Vicki Wine has said, as long as I have King Jesus, yes. I don't need nobody else. Church, you might not think it, but I know it. worship the almighty God yes. to reverence his holy and his righteous name. Yes. Now church, I've said it many times before from this pulpit that we live in a unique time in the history of the world. Yes. Now it's not to say that we are seeing things that have never been because Ecclesiastes 1 and 9 informs me that what has been is going to be again. Mm -hmm. That what has been done will be done again. That there is nothing new under the sun. Yeah. See, it just seems, however, that in these days and times, that evil no longer hides. That evil no longer lurks in the shadows. But evil is overt and it's out in your face. Yes. Every day when you watch the news and look at your social media feed, you see things that either break your heart or turn your stomach. Yes. So yes, even though these times are unique, I'm glad to say that it doesn't catch God by surprise. All right. I'm glad to say that it doesn't catch God off guard. It doesn't make him unfooted up. He is always sure-footed and knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. See, that's why I will continue to stay by his side. Yes. Because he knows my issues, church, and yes. he knows my problems. Yes. He knows my ups and he knows my downs. Yes. He knows me in all times, and I can recognize and say, you are still God yeah. of my life. Yeah. See, a God that sits high, but a God that looks low, a God that is a keeper of my soul and a yeah. keeper of public. Yeah. That's the God I serve. You might not say that, but I'm going to say, yeah, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So today, I want to 
us to continue yes. to look at the power of God yes. and how we can allow him to reside in us. Yes. And again, I love the English language because when we say reside in us, we mean to resonate in our being. Yes. Yes. And the word resonate means that it just continues to hum. It continues to sing inside you like the, the resonance of a drum. We can hear that sound and it starts to beat life inside of us. The resonance of Jesus Christ coming in and working inside my life. That is why I like that. Why I feel what I talk about the God we serve. See, that is who we speak of. That resonation of goodness and truth that comes out when I talk to you in my life. So please, if you have your Bibles or devices, turn to that wonderful gospel that was read in Luke. We're going to look at the sixth chapter and begin reading at that first verse, Luke 6 and 1. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some of the heads of grain rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing this? This is unlawful on the Sabbath. Jesus answered, have you ever read where David did what he, when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Go down to verse 9. Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy? Mm -hmm. He looked around at them all and then said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Going down to verse 12, and it said, one, On one of those days, Jesus went to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Yes. On one of those days, he went to a mountainside to pray and spent all night praying to God. So church, when we look at this, we actually see that we are in a Lukean gospel. And the writer is the great apostle Luke. And it opens up with the travels of Jesus Christ and his disciples. Now, Luke's gospel actually starts with a hungered Christ and a group of his disciples. The sixth chapter opens up and Jesus and the disciples are walking through a cornfield and they're plucking and they're eating the corn. Now, the text does not reveal that whose fields these belong to. It basically seems that when they were walking through, it almost seemed that like it was an act of stealing. But this could not be further from the truth. See, according to Deuteronomy 23 and 25, it was lawful to perform this act. They had the right to do this because the text in Deuteronomy actually gives provision for the poor yes. to have the yes. ability to actually walk through the grain fields and glean from the harvest. Yes. So they were right in doing this in such a manner. Mm -hmm. However, this act was on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. This act was on the Sabbath. And it was witnessed by a group of legalistic yeah, Pharisees. Yeah, yeah. Now, the word legalistic just means that these were folks that had to be right. Mm -hmm. See, they can tell you about Abraham and his wife, Sarah. They can give you understanding about how the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. They can tell you a lot of facts and a lot of reasoning. Mm -hmm. But they couldn't tell you anything about Jesus. Yeah. Oh, right. Right. See, they could inform you. They couldn't inform you anything about the Lord. They couldn't inform you anything about how he is Savior and Creator and Maker. Uh -huh. And how in him you can have life more abundant. Uh -huh. They couldn't speak about the love of Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. And also his impending sacrifice. They couldn't tell you anything about it, church, because they knew it all. Uh -huh. See, these men questioned what Jesus was doing. See, it's not that they thought he was stealing. They truly understood the text in Deuteronomy. They understood that provision. But the fact that he was doing it on the Sabbath troubled them to their core. Mm -hmm. Now, according to Jewish tradition, remember the Sabbath day was a day in which no work was to be performed. Yeah. Some texts mention that you couldn't even draw water on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. 
So when they question the master, he actually gives them a rebuke and stops them in their tracks. See, he informs them because he knew that these men were legalistic and would have this knowledge about the great King David. Mm -hmm. Remember a man that was after God's own heart. Mm -hmm. A man who was placed in high esteem in the society. Jesus recalls their memory about a time when David and his men were home. And that David and his men went into the temple and they ate the shoe bread from the house of God because they were home. Now, church, remember this shoe bread, a show bread, was also called the bread of presence. And it was only meant for the priests. See, it was just 12 cakes of bread that represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And they were placed on the tabernacle and they were there from one Sabbath to the next and only to be eaten by priests. Now, even though David would be a king, he wasn't a priest. Even though he was in a place of respect, he did not have a priestly title. So traditionally, King David and his men were out of order. But tradition, church, couldn't satisfy his need. All right. Tradition could not satisfy that he was hungry and needed to have some substance in his body. So they ate the bread and were satisfied. See, they took that felt and that bread that was for priests and took it and filled their bellies with it and they were satisfied. See, sometimes, church, you need to place traditional ideas on the back burner and take care of what is real. See, Jesus was telling them that human need far outweighed tradition. That human need was what was really important in that time. I understand that those 12 loaves were for priests. I understand that those 12 loaves had a sacredness. But what is more sacred than feeding a hungry person? Jesus tells me to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to take care of the widows. That's what the Lord is not about, the ceremonial stuff. I enjoy being a Baptist and I enjoy our Baptist polity and policy. But that means nothing when I'm trying to save a soul from the kingdom. I'm not a Baptist preacher when I'm saving souls. I'm a Christian person telling you about the goodness of the Lord. That's what's important, not that title. And that's what Jesus wanted them to see. It wasn't about the bread, but it was about what you did with the bread for a group of hungry men. See, when you're hungry, you need to be fed. When you're thirsty, you need to be given a drink. And when you're homeless, you need to be given some shit. But see, church, these are basic needs. Supply my needs and I will hear what you have to say. So we see the meaning of the text just goes a little further. Because it lets me know that if I have to work on Sunday, and God gave me that job, then I need to be on that man's job, baby. Amen. Amen. That I need to do whatever is necessary because God provides. Yes. I can still worship him. Yes. I can still give him glory. Yes. I can still give him praise. Yes. I can still reverence his name. Yes. It should be locked into just one 24-hour period. Yes. Yes. So Jesus himself recognized that human need and said that ritualistic dedication should be thrown out of the window. Mm -hmm. So he proved this very point when he told those legalistic Pharisees that the, he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. yes. Simply put, God is in control of Sunday, yes. not man. Amen. So then the text leads us to another Sabbath day or another Sunday morning. And we see Jesus teaching in the synagogue. Mm -hmm. And at the time of his teaching, there, are, uh, there was a man with a withered hand. Now, at this, remember, the Pharisees and the scribes were just sitting off in the corner. As we say, they were sitting off in the cut, just seeing what Jesus was going to do. They recognized that it was the Sabbath, and would this radical rabbi heal this man with a withered hand? So, looking at it, it seems funny in this scripture. They were trying to see what Jesus would do, and they were upset with what Jesus would do on the Sabbath. But if Jesus were healing on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, they would have been okay with it. See, this seems hypocritical, and I thought 
process. Because yes, the Sabbath is important, but remember that man's hand was important to him as well. See, that man wanted to, he needed a touch from the divine. He needed God to touch him. He didn't see Jesus to say, well, it's the Sabbath day. You come back on Monday. I'll take care of your problem. See, church, all that, y'all should have been shouting amen. But that means I can go to Jesus any day of the week. He'll take care of my problem. God. 
Then he tells them, whosoever says to this mountain, be thou removed and cast in the sea and shall not doubt in their heart, but shall believe that that thing shall be done, then it shall come to pass. He's saying if we have faith and belief, not just a blind faith saying, oh, I know it's going to be done, but a faith that is rooted and grounded in scripture and in the words of Christ, a faith that can move mountains, a faith that can relieve struggles, a faith that can stop hardships, and a faith that can be with you in trials. A faith that is focused and a faith that is active. Yes. So church, we look at these two pieces of scripture and we see a central theme. In Luke 6, we see that after all those difficulties with the Pharisees, that Jesus took himself to a mountain and he prayed. Mm -hmm. In Luke 13, we see Jesus telling us that if we speak to mountains, mm -hmm. they shall be removed. Yeah. Yeah. See, in each instance, we see a reference to a mountain. Mountains that are necessary and mountains that provide solace. So today, I would like to look at this very subject and give you just a thought for this week. The mountains in my life. The mountains in my life. Now, church, when we think about it, a mountain is just a physical piece, a physical rock. It's a large landform that arises above the surrounding areas, and usually it has a peak. Mountains are seen all over the world. We have mountains that are seen in Blue, the Blue Ridge Mountains of Georgia. We see have Mount Everest that's seen in the Himalayas. They are all formed through what they say are landmass ships, which shipments, which basically are tectonic forces that cause volcanic activity to spew forth and create these land masses. So we actually also see in Genesis, God set up the mountains, the trees, and the vegetation. See, yes, I understand what mountains are scientifically, and I do not question the creator of the mountains because God has created all things and they were all good. But basically, we look at these things and we look at this mountain, and Jesus gives us some insight. See, in the text, we are laser focused on two specific types of mountain. There's a mountain of solace and a mountain of struggle. Mm -hmm. See, the text in Luke actually informs us about the mountain of solace. Mm -hmm. See, Jesus in the text separates himself from the world. The Pharisees were trying to accuse him of any and everything that they could find. Jesus was doing good things, and what he was doing was not inappropriate at all. But they said those things just because they did not like him. He was upsetting the balance. They were the ones who had the position of power, and they didn't want any young rabbi to usurp their position. The Pharisees were used to being the ones in charge. They were used to being the ones in control. Oh, church, you might have seen these folks, people that you might have met on your jobs or even in your family. Okay. They're the ones that feel good as long as they call all the shots. Okay. They are good when they are in control of the situation. Okay. See, the moment you speak and start to talk up, then they look at you a little bit differently. Okay. They automatically turn against you because they're the ones that always need to be the one with the last word and the final say so. Oh, well, I hear you, amen, and so I know you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> See, that boss that used to praise you at work, but then when you do something that's good and everybody looks at you with favor, he starts to criticize everything else you do after that. Saying, oh, I think there's a better way to solve that problem. Or oh, that cousin who always manages the family reunions. You know, she always does the family reunions and plans it out, does the food and everything. And then one day you say, you know what, let's not get catered from Big Lee's. Let's get catered from somebody else. And she started to look at you funny, eh? Uh -huh. But we've all had these things happen in our life. We've been through it all. The Pharisees were like this, and they enjoyed this freedom and control and power that they had over the Jewish people. But then steps in Jesus, who simply had a servant's heart. Not coming to control, not coming to boss, not coming to rule, but just coming to inform that the wages of sin is death, yes. but the gift of God is eternal life. All that they had to get rid of. See, he doesn't want anything but your heart. I can't compete with somebody like that because I want your revenue, eh? amen. Right. So, so we get to look at this, and then Jesus, after all of this, goes to 
that mountain of solace. The text informs us that he prayed all night on that mountain. Church, I don't know about you, but sometimes I need to get away to my mountain of solace. When it seems to be trouble and difficulty on every side, I don't know, whatever it may be. Every day we see something about the economy. We see something about a natural disaster. We see something upsetting in social media. The list goes on and on. It seems you just get inundated with bad news. But we have to have a place where we can go to our city. Both physically and metaphorically. Go to a mountain and speak to God. Go to the mountain and tell God about all of our troubles. Go to the mountain and tell God about all of our problems. Go to the mountain and tell God how we love him. And how we want his continued grace and favor over our lives and the lives of our families. See, church, we have to have a time where we go to God just in songs. Not asking him, not just berating him, but just going to be with him. See, church, is good, I tell you, because when you have that time with God, there's nothing like it. It's a genuineness that's attached to it because it's just you and God and not you and the outside world. And see, that's why I say my time of solace is when I get up in the morning and drive it to work. Because I can talk to God. Yes, I'm looking at the road, but I can talk to God. And see, I love it now because a lot of cars have where the phone comes in and if you're talking, it doesn't look like you're talking crazy. So I can tell God what's going on with me. I can pray for people. I can do all of those things in that time frame of that 15 to 20 minutes in my drive to work. And it just makes the day so much better. Because problems do come. We live in a human world. But when those problems come, you can remember that conversation you had with the master. And how you just laid it out upon him and said, God, I know you can take care of me. God, I know you are in control. God, no matter what, I'm going to lean on you with everything that I have. Church, you can pray for your family in those times. You can pray for those who have lost a loved one in those times. You can pray for your church to continue to do what God has required us to do. You can pray for leadership to allow them to move in the way God has wants them to move. You can pray that we all live up to the expectation that God has called us all for a special purpose. And we all have a purpose on this planet. And let us live up to it and share the witness of Jesus Christ. See, it's funny, church, when you're talking to God, you just get wrapped up in it. Yeah. And sometimes it goes from 15 to 20 minutes. Seriously, I sit sometimes just in the parking lot on the job still talking to the master. Yeah. Still just thanking him for his goodness, his truth, his mercy, and his grace. Just allowing him to move and allowing him to set up my day because I know I'm going to need him. Yeah. See, that's the solace that we need. And that's the mountain sometimes, church, that we must go to. But see, there was another mountain that he spoke about. We talked about the one of solace, but there was also a mountain of struggle. See, Mount Everest Church is seen as the tallest peak on the planet. They say it's 29,000 feet above sea level. It is the highest point on the earth. And even though I tell you Mount Everest peak is high, that mountain of struggle that you have sometime in your life can sit a little bit higher. Yeah. Yeah. When things in your life are out of control, it seems that Everest is something you can walk over and the struggle is something you walk right into. Yeah. Yeah. See, you can't control ups and downs in the economy. Mm -hmm. You can't control the actions of others. Mm -hmm. That's including the ones we love. Right. You can't control the weather and its effects on your home or your livelihood. Mm -hmm. See, at times, church, we can't even control ourselves. All right. See, this lack of control, this inability to have answers, can lead to difficulties and struggles. Some of us right now are struggling with illnesses in our families. Some of us right now are struggling with problems that were started from us. See, it's funny. You might see, you might not see what that person is going to because that struggle can be insidious. It might not be something that's affecting them on the outside, but in the inside, it just starts raging all over. Yeah, yeah. And we are good at hiding things. Yeah. We are good at not telling people, how you doing that? Oh, I feel all right. Knowing that your world is just crashing all the way down, and you really should have told somebody that you weren't feeling good so they could have hugged you, supported you, and prayed with you. Yeah. Church, we can't hide anymore. We have to tell God, and we have to tell our Christian friends what's going on so they can pray and help us get stronger. Because struggle or problems that we feel, sometimes it might be for fear of embarrassment.
embarrassment or judgment that we don't seek the help that we need. But even though we feel that we cannot verbally say or talk about these difficulties or struggles, they still wear on us from day to day. Yes. And one thing I know about struggle, it can actually give you a physical manifestation. Yes. Stress is a killer. Yes. It can affect your heart. Yes. It can affect your kidneys. Yes. It can affect the way you breathe. Yes. It can affect your attitude. Yes. Stress can affect your body. If you don't believe it, just get stressed out. Right. It will be all over you. Yes. It will do things to you when you're wondering what's going on. Yes. It can also lead to depression and anxiety. That's yes. what stress can do. Yes. You've got to relieve that stress yes. and put it on the shoulders of somebody that can take care of you. Yes. You've got to relieve that stress and make sure that it's on shoulders that are stronger than yours. Yes, yes I do believe in talking with somebody. I believe in talking to people yes. who are trained to help you with your yes. stress. Yes. But I also believe in going to a holy God yes. and allowing him Yeah. 
impart knowledge to you in that situation. He'll give you what you need. You just have to believe and rely on him. That mountain shall be removed. It shall be removed. See, church, in these red tips, we see our Lord talking about mountains. In these scriptures, in Luke 6 specifically, we see a mountain can be a place of salt. And in times in our lives, we need to separate ourselves from the world and go to that place and tell it all to King Jesus. We need to be refocused and refreshed every day in him. But he also gives us the ability to speak to a mountain of struggle, yes. to speak to a mountain of hardship. Yes. He lets us know that if we believe in him and have faith, he can do it, and that mountain will be removed from our lives. Yes. Wherever you are in your relationship with Jesus Christ, I ask that you simply remember these scriptures. Take it from the Gospel of Luke and take it from the Gospel of Mark. Remember, they spoke of these mountains. Yes. Mountains you need serve for solace and mountains you need removed. Right. Church, it's all about the mountains in your life. Yes. All about the mountains in your life. Yes. May God bless you and may God bless you. I'll tell you, I know God can do it all. Amen. I know he can move in the lives of men and women and allow them to see brighter days. And that's why I enjoy this part of the service because if you don't know Christ for yourself and don't know that he can move that mountain of struggle or in him you can found that place of solace, then today is your day to get to know him just a little bit better. Christ Jesus has open arms and he wants you to be part of his family. But you just have to yield yourself and give it all to him. He can do all of these things in your life. He can transform your life, but you just have to humble yourself and come to Jesus Christ. But it might be one who said, I did that, and I went outside in the world, and that seemed great, but now I feel him. Christ is right here to fill that hole, to fill that void in your life. You just have to come back home, repent of your sins, and allow him to come in and move mightily in your life. But you might be one who says, you know what, I enjoy worship and we pray to God. I enjoy how they come humble to the feet of the master and love on each other. If you want to be a member of the church, come down a day as well. We enjoy you to be part of this family in Christ Jesus. So if any of those three fits you, just come on down to me. Give God your heart and the pastor your hand. So as we sing, search your heart. Search your heart.
I want to be saved. And I'm I am. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
God say amen. 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 Amen